Uh, as a child, I remember watching uh, on TV, in between the cartoons, public service announcements. And uh, they were designed, of course, to catch your eye, catch your ear, so that you would not do what they're telling you to not do. Uh, I can remember one in particular when I was a kid where it started with a frying pan and someone grabbed two eggs and they said, this is your brain. They cracked the eggs, threw them on the frying pan. This is your brain on drugs. And then the clincher to bring it in. Any questions? That was all it was. It was about 20 seconds long and I still remember it to this day. I tried to share it once with the teenagers downstairs. They didn't they didn't appreciate it like I had, and so that's when I started to realize I am getting old. Uh, there were other things. One channel ran something called The More You Know, and they would trot out their, their various stars who would come on TV and tell you, you know, don't bully, be nice to mom and dad, uh, don't, don't do drugs, these kinds of things, and then do, 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 the more you know, and everyone was happy, all right, and we would walk away and things were good. Uh, when I was a young child, my favorite public service announcement involved that wonderful bear named Smokey. Uh, Smokey the bear existed for one purpose, and that was to tell us that only you can do what? Prevent, Prevent force. See, it worked. Some of you still remember. Now, to, much to my dismay as a child, there was no cartoon show of Smokey. He only existed in these commercials. I always thought they should flesh this out, but it would probably be the same thing every week. Forest fire, Smokey puts it out, there you go. So you really can't get much out of that. Uh, but we are preconditioned to believe that forest fires are bad. And in a lot of cases, they are. Let me say that. In a lot of cases, they are. When we see on television people fleeing their homes, when we see people running for cover, that's not a good thing. But ecologists are saying that in certain circumstances, a fire in a forest is a good thing. Uh, a small forest fire will burn through and it will burn a lot of the undergrowth, a lot of the fallen leaves, which will then allow for water to penetrate deeper into the forest. In other circumstances, if some of the trees, uh, of the leaves of the top of the tree are removed in some kind of fire or other fashion, it allows for sunlight to get deeper into the forest to hit some of that life that's on the ground. There are certain plants that when they sense smoke or they sense heat, they immediately uh, traject or eject all of their seeds. And so in certain circumstances, the, the best seeding of a forest is done in a fire condition or a fire-like condition. There are other plants that won't germinate unless it's burnt. And so there are a lot of different things that occur where we can look and say a forest fire isn't always wrong. The, the death, in a sense, and the, and the destruction that a forest fire might bring, in some sense, leads to life. And this morning, as we talk about Jesus on the cross, as we talk about his death, we're going to talk about a death that leads to life, a death that brings life, not just eternal life, because it's easy for us to look and say, you know what, it's like my fire insurance card. Once I die, uh, it's the, or the Monopoly get out of jail free card, I just put that down upon death, I'm taken to heaven, and hey, I'm done. That's all the cross is important for. But that's not true. In reality and in essence, the, the life that Jesus brings to us is not just eternal life, but it is daily life. It's a Monday life. All right, It's a Tuesday life. He brings us purpose and he brings us a, a plan for our life. And by looking at this passage in Luke, which is on page 1,124 today, I believe that we will see as Jesus is dying, as he's dying a dramatic death, we're going to see that that death brings new life brings eternal life, and it brings significance to daily life, but that it also demands from each of us a response. Now, we've already talked about in the past what happened on the cross. We talked about how Jesus dealt with our condemnation, how he dealt with the curse, he dealt with the shame that was meant for us. And so we're not going to talk as much about what the cross does in that sense today because we've already been there. Last week, Pastor Matt explained what happened when one of the thieves turned to Christ, when one of the thieves understood that there's something different about this man and how he's dying here, he is different. And the thief asked Jesus to remember him when he's in paradise. And Jesus says, I will. And you will be with me even today. So this week as we come here, we come to the actual death of Christ. And, and I want to invite you to stand with me, if you will, as we read this passage. Starting in verse 44 of Luke chapter 11. 
It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for the spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home, beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and all the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance, watching these things. Father, will you help us to listen carefully today? Use my words. May my spirit be attentive to what you're doing. It's in your name we pray. Amen. (coughs) Excuse me. History is full of dramatic deaths. Some of you lived through the death of John F. Kennedy. You remember what it was like for a teacher to come into your class and say that the president has been killed. I can remember as a young child preparing for and being excited about the launch of the Challenger spaceship and not fully understanding what was going on when people are trying to explain that something bad happened. Drama in death is something that occurs often. But there has never been a death as dramatic as this one. There has never been a death as dramatic as the death of Christ. And Jesus' death was so dramatic that Warren Wiersbe has said that it was as though all nature, all of nature was sympathizing with the Creator as He suffered and died. And by not being there, we lose out on what exactly was going on. We lose out on on the drama that's surrounding Jesus' death. But Luke gives us a couple pictures. And the first picture that Luke gives to describe this drama is to tell us that there was darkness over the land. He said there was darkness between the sixth and the ninth hour. This is between 12 noon and 3 in the afternoon. Darkness. Now, it is not usually dark during that time. Some people will try and explain this away as a coincidence. Well, yes, it was dark, but it was probably an eclipse because three-hour eclipses, those are normal, right? Those happen a lot. And so people will want to explain it away as a coincidence. What we need to understand is that this was not normal. And this, in, in this darkness, God is saying something. He's demonstrating that for a moment, darkness wins. For a moment, it appears as though the God-man is dead, that the Savior is gone. For a moment, darkness reigns, and creation is crying out against that. Something bad has happened. But for deliverance to come, for our deliverance to come through the death of Christ, darkness has to come first. The Israelite people kind of understood this. The Jewish people would have been reminded of another time that darkness preceded deliverance. You see, prior to the the tenth and final plague over uh, the Egyptian people, the the land sat in darkness for three days. Three days of darkness uh, uh, came prior to, or preceded, excuse me, the original Passover. That first Passover celebrated the deliverance from sin, or the deliverance from slavery in Egypt, rather. And so darkness was marking and telling the people, in a sense, that deliverance is coming. And here also there is darkness So that we may know, looking back now, we may understand that there was darkness, but deliverance was on its way. Jesus' death is delivering. It is a delivering death, and it delivers us to the life that we can have in him and through him. And so in this darkness, we understand that it's very dramatic. But Luke goes a step further. He takes us from uh, the mount, or he takes us from the hill where Jesus is dying and brings us into the temple. Luke also tells us that as the light from the sun fails, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Now, we might read that and go, okay, that sounds bad, right? Some of you who are very particular at your home, you read curtain torn in two, and you, oh, what? All right, what what does this mean? Where is the significance here? It might be easy to move past this statement, but it communicates something important in our life. You see, this curtain divided the people. It divided people from the place where God had localized his presence within the temple. When the temple was constructed, there was an area, the Holy of Holies, where uh, when the presence of God visibly came into the temple, that is where it went. And so to the Jewish people, that is where God resided. That is where his presence dwelt. And that part was separated from everyone else. A high priest would enter into there, but only him, to perform a sacrifice 
But the people were kept from God's presence. There was a division. It was a reminder that they could not relate to God on their own because of the sin in their life, because of the guilt, because of the condemnation, because of the curse, because of the shame in their life. They could not relate directly to God. They needed this this system, this sacrificial system to remind them of their sinfulness, to remind them of their need for salvation, to remind them of their need for deliverance. And here, as the sky is dark, as Jesus is dying, that curtain miraculously tears in two. Because what God is saying in that moment is that the curse and the condemnation and the shame that has since divided us has been laid upon Jesus. He has dealt with that. And now we can have a relationship with him. Now we can enter into that everyday relationship with God. We no longer need an altar. We no longer need sacrifices. We no longer need a system of rituals. We no longer need a priest. We can relate directly to God. We can speak directly to him. And that's what's being shown here. This curtain that is torn in two announces that the way into God's presence is no longer through some kind of ritual, but it comes through Christ. We come to God's presence through him. So in two dramatic events, the darkness that surrounded them and the curtain being torn in two, Luke is explaining to us that there's drama here. Matthew goes on and talks about an earthquake that took place at the same time. So it's as though creation is responding to what is going on. It's as though this is the most dramatic death that has ever taken place because it is a delivering death. And we can stay there and we can meditate on that and we can uh, live in the, in the uh, bask in the glory of the awesomeness of what God can do in that moment. But if we don't let it affect our everyday life, then we haven't gone far enough. So Luke narrates all of this drama, but then he, he shows what is going on, how Jesus is handling, how Jesus is reacting to this dramatic event. And in that, we can see how our lives can be different because his death makes it possible for us to live, and it also shows us how to live. So let's look at how Jesus dies. The first thing is that Jesus dies with Scripture on his lips. He dies with Scripture on his lips. The last words of a person are usually very important if they're recorded. And here Jesus' words are being kept for us. And he says, into your hand, into your hand I commit my spirit. Father, into your hand I commit my spirit. And after this, Jesus dies. Jesus decides in that moment that he will voluntarily give up his life. It's a reminder again that he's in full control of what is going on. He commits his spirit. His spirit isn't taken. His life isn't taken. He gives it up because Jesus is in control. And in his death, he quotes scripture. This comes from Psalm 31. Psalm 31, 5 says this, Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. Psalm 31 is most likely a lullaby tune or a lullaby hymn that was used by families with their small children. If you were raising a young Jew during that time, they would sit on your knee, you would hold them in your arms, and you would sing to them, much like we would do, and they would sing this psalm. This is probably something that Jesus learned very young in the arms of Mary, on the the knee of Joseph, as they sang this song to him, as they talked about how God had redeemed them. And that has stuck in Jesus' mind to this point. And here, as he is on the cross, Jesus cries out, and he repeats what he learned so long ago about his Father. He sings back this lullaby once again. And so in this moment, Scripture is on his lips. He is calling this out and so as we as we see that as we see that Jesus is using scripture at the end of his life maybe we should approach the idea of scripture the idea of memorization with a little more seriousness than we do because verse memorization is starting to go the way of the telephone I don't even know people's phone numbers anymore I just know names right and a lot of us if we need to find a verse we just pull out our phone and we look it up all right? It talks in Scripture about hiding God's Word in our heart, not in Siri. All right? It's not about calling out to your phone and telling you where it is. It's about making these words important to you, putting them in your heart, storing them up in your heart. We do this very well with children. 
kids right now are in their Sunday school classes. Some of them are probably learning scripture. When they come on Wednesday night, they are paired up with different adults who love them, who mentor them, and who lead them in learning scripture. Yet at some point, by and large, we adults, we just back off and we think that we don't need that anymore. We learned a lot of verses when we were young. Tell me one. Um, Jesus wept. Right? We can, we can uh, regurgitate a few, but we've quit this discipline. Why is that? It's because I think as adults, we quit a lot of disciplines when we don't have to do them anymore. I quit math. All right? When I was able to abandon math and run away from it, I did. I fleed. I fled. I, also English. I fled English. <laughs> all right? I ran away from math so quickly. Uh, when I got to geometry, to me it was a great lie. They started the first semester, like, here are shapes. I'm like, this is good. I can do shapes. That's nice. And then the second half, they're like, you know shapes. Now learn theorems. Learn proofs. I'm like, this isn't real. So I don't even do math anymore. I mean, I, I went the route of English and, and history. I learned all that because math was not my thing. I just left it alone. Right? Some of you know what I'm talking about there. Some of you, thank you. Some are nodding. I heard an amen. Not really a time for an amen, but that's okay. All right? Math people are not smiling. But math people never smile, so it's not really that big of a deal. <laughs> Someone like that in the back there, that's good. All right, I'll apologize to all the math people afterwards. It's something that we've left behind for some of us. Others of you, you leave other things behind. Why have we left scripture memorization behind, by and large? Some of you are good with it, I know. Some aren't. Some of us have grown in our, in our life, we've grown in our spiritual life, but for whatever reason, we quit memorizing scripture. Here, Jesus, at the end of his life, quotes scripture. He's dying with scripture on his lips. Do we have scripture in our hearts? I have stored your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. Do you battle with sin? Do you fight with these things? One of the weapons that we have been given is scripture. Read it. Memorize it. Drink it in so that when your child comes to you with a question about something from scripture, sometimes you might just be able to say, I know where that verse is. And then they will see that it's something that you value as well. Other times you'll have to say, honestly, let's look it up. And that's fine. So that when you're having a, a discussion with someone at work and they say, well, what does the Bible say about blah, 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 blah? And you say, well, I actually know a couple verses on that. And you go there. Or when you are having a conversation with someone at work and it's not going well. It's not even about Scripture, but they're yelling at you. You didn't get a report in on time. You didn't uh, finish your work or you parked in the wrong spot or who knows what it is. And you, in your mind, you want to lash out by saying, I, mm, you know, I will give it. You, the scripture comes back into your heart, comes from your heart into your mind, and you're reminded of how you should respond. See, Jesus died with scripture on his lips. We need to live with scripture flowing out of us in our conversation and in our interactions with other people. Jesus died with scripture on his lips, but he also died with confidence. Jesus cries out. He cries out and says, into your hand I commit my spirit. He knows where he's going. At the end of his time, he knows that he has fulfilled the plan that God has for him and that now he is going to heaven. I have watched and been with some people at the end of their life. And some that have that hope, that know what Christ has done, that know that he's taken their condemnation, their curse, and their shame. There may be some anxiety, there may be some worry, but there is no doubt where they are going. They're dying with confidence. They're dying in a sense of peace. There's nothing peaceful about Jesus' death except the death itself. When he hangs there and says, I'm going to give my spirit up to you, he's saying that in confidence and he's saying that in a moment of peace. This is how Jesus is dying. And this is how we need to live. We need to live understanding that Christ has dealt with our condemnation, our curse, and our shame. And just as he had confidence that in his death he has fulfilled what God has called him to do, we can have confidence that because of his death, we can experience and will experience heaven when we die on this earth. Because Jesus died, we can live. His confidence and peace reminds us that this is not the end for us. Paul also reminds us of this confidence in 1 Corinthians 15, all right, where he says, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The reason Paul can say that is because Jesus has dealt with that. Death hurts on earth. Death isn't right in a sense, but we don't have to worry about what death brings us because Jesus has dealt with that. 
Romans 14 also tells us that whether we live or we die, we are the Lord's. Whether we live or we die, we are His. And these great truths should give us great confidence. And when we have great confidence in what Christ has done, then what we end up doing is we hold on to this earth, this world, a little looser. We loosen the grip to this world. We loosen the grip to the things that people say are important. And instead, we cling with a greater force to Christ. And when we do that, we can risk. We can risk our reputation. We can risk our finances. We can even risk our life because God has given us a confidence in knowing that we are with him and will be with him, and he has given us a peace. There was a man named Ronnie Smith. Ronnie Smith was on staff at a church called Austin Stone Community Church. He was a deacon there. And when the Libyan government fell, uh, Ronnie Smith felt called to go there and work. He had a wife and a young child. And they moved from Dallas to Libya, where he became a chemistry teacher at an international school. People probably said lots of things to him, like, you're crazy. You have a young child. Why would you put them in danger? Why would you leave this job that you have? Why would you go over there? You don't have grandparents near you who can take care of your children. You're going to be in a different place. It's going to be hard. All of these things. Yet, he understood that risk here, risk in this circumstance, is good. Risk is right. Because God had given him a confidence and God had given him a peace that no matter what happens, he was doing what the Father had called him to do. Before this past Christmas, Ronnie's uh, wife and child had come home, and while he was jogging through the streets of Libya, he was shot to death. Now, cynics will say, well, what did you expect? You should have known that that was coming. Don't go over there. Don't care about those people. They just want to kill you. Don't love them. But Ronnie knew something else. Ronnie knew that he was in as much in need of a Savior as they were. Ronnie knew that God had dealt with his condemnation, his curse, and his shame, and he wanted that message to be shared with the Libyans as well. When he died, the Christian blogosphere, which I tend to follow, uh, lit up. Everyone and their brother seemed to want to write about him. One person who wrote about him was John Piper. And John Piper said that in reaction to the death of Ronnie Smith, he said this, that this kind of risk is right. He said, we're not called to a life of safety, but one of commitment. We're called to a life that is marked by caring of the cross. Jesus had confidence. Jesus had peace. But he was hanging on a cross. Then Piper said this, Finally, I call thousands of you to take Ronnie's place. They will not kill us fast enough. Let the replacements flood the world. We do not seek death. We seek the everlasting joy of the world, including our enemies. If they kill us while we love them, we are in good company. Jesus did not call us to ease or safety. He called us to love for the sake of his name everywhere among all peoples. How can we do that? How do we have a heart like that? We have confidence and peace in the Lord of creation who holds our lives. He's working all things according to his plan for his glory. See, Jesus died with confidence knowing that his death would bring us life. And we're called to live our life with that same confidence. Understanding that the life that we have is a life that has been given to us because of what Jesus has done. And so you may not be called to a dangerous place. But you might be called to a dangerous place. Do not sit here today and think that because of your youth or because of your opposite of youth, you are not being called to risk something. You are not being called to get up and go somewhere. Sometimes we preach and we talk about missionaries and they're these far off uh, people. And sometimes every now and then someone goes on a trip and that is great. I don't want to downplay that. But there could be people in here today who God's calling you. God's calling you to risk something because of the confidence that that we can have because of what Christ has done. God's calling you to risk something. And we live in a society where we don't like to risk. We live in a society where we watch the ticker all the time, where we wonder where our 401k is, 403b, 404040, all of those things. And we worry, have we left enough for our children? Will we have enough for our kids when they go to college? And we worry about these things. We need to loosen our grip on the world and tighten our grip on Christ. Tighten our grip on what he may be calling us to do. And it may be that you're not called to go a world away. It may be that you're just called to have a a conversation at work. It may be that you're just called to announce yourself in some way as a Christian. It may be that you're just called to live a different life. 
But whatever it is, we've all been called. We've all been called with the same gospel to take that and share that with the nations. And that can be your neighbor, and that can be people around the world. But we have all been called. And the reason that we can do this is not because we're good people. It's not because we're Americans. It's not because we have resources. It's not because we have strength. It's because we have confidence. We have confidence in our Savior. We have peace in knowing that no matter what life brings us, He has our salvation. He has us in his hand. And so this understanding requires of us a response. And Luke outlines three kinds of responses as we finish up this passage. The first is this, and I need to move quickly. The first is that we must understand his innocence. There's a big theme in Luke. Constantly, Luke is telling us, reminding us, Jesus is innocent. And here at the end of this passage, you have a centurion looking at Jesus, a Roman soldier, someone who has uh, uh, overseen the crucifixion of Christ, now looking at him saying, Sir, surely this man is innocent. He has seen what Jesus has done. He's seen the darkness. All right, He's seen uh, and heard what Jesus has said from the cross, and he understands in that moment, this man is innocent. Luke wants us to get that. Because in order for our curse, the condemnation, and shame to be dealt with, we need an innocent sacrifice, and that's who Jesus is. That's why the temple is torn. That's why the temple curtain is torn, because Jesus is that innocent sacrifice. But Jesus' innocence is only good news for us if we understand our guilt. And in the next picture that Luke gives us, we have this picture of the people. The same people that are calling out for Jesus. They have come looking for a spectacle. They've assembled for a spectacle. And when they see all that has taken place, when they hear the words of Jesus, when they see what has happened, they understand that they have done something wrong as well. And they walk away and go home beating their chest. This is, a, this is an action of understanding that I have the guilt for this. And we may want to pause and lay the guilt on the Romans who nailed him to the cross, lay the guilt on the Jewish leaders who are calling out for his death. The guilt lies on us. We put Jesus on the cross. Our sin put him there. Our guilt, our curse, our condemnation put him there. Jesus' innocence is only good news for us if we understand our guilt. And when we have those two together, we understand our guilt and we cling to his innocence, then we are called to respond. We are called to respond. And at the end of this passage, we read this. And all his acquaintances, being Jesus's, all of his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. We're not told what they're thinking. Luke doesn't go into detail right here to show us what happened, but he does in the future. At the end of Luke, Luke ends, Acts picks up. And if you go and you read through Acts, you see that these people responded to Jesus. They came to a point where they were willing to risk. His acquaintances and these women went out and shared the gospel, some of them to the point of death, most of them to the point of death. Risk was in their life, but because they had confidence, because they had peace in knowing that Jesus had taken care of that, they were willing to risk. They were willing to live confidently and with Scripture on their lips. This is what they were called to do. This is what we are called to do. Jesus calls us to abandon ourselves, to no longer rely on our own innocence, and instead to cling to him. This morning, we have a number of opportunities for you to respond. Something may have been said this morning, something may have been sung, and you in your heart, you feel like you need to respond. In a moment, we're going to share in communion. If you uh, believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, then we invite you to share communion with us. If you're here seeking, if you're here learning, if you're here and you're not just ready to say that, then just let let the plate pass. As it comes by, we want you to take both the bread and the juice. We want you to hold on to those things. But as we do this, we're doing this as a, as a memory, as a remembrance of the sacrifice that God has done, that Jesus gave. This is about his body and his blood and what that means for us. After we share in communion, the choir is going to sing a song. And as they're singing, I want you to focus in on the words that are being sung. I want them to be a prayer in your heart. I want you to respond to God in some way through that. And then after service comes to a close, some of you may be at a point today where you feel like you need to commit to something. Maybe you just really do not understand what it means to be a Christian. Maybe you just really don't understand these things that we talk about when we say the cross and and sin and salvation. Come forward at the end. While everyone else is leaving, hang back. Come forward. There will be people here to pray with you. Maybe God is saying something in your heart today that you need to commit to something greater. He's given you an idea of risk. You might know what that risk is. 
And you might just know that you're being called to risk. Come forward at the end of service so that we can pray for you, we can care for you, we can love you, we can stand by you. So you're going to have those three opportunities. And the first opportunity that we're going to celebrate together is communion. And so as the ushers or those that are serving come forward, I want to invite you to bow your head. I want to invite you to uh, just spend a moment examining yourself. Scripture says that that's important, that before we share in this in this uh, celebration together that we investigate, we look at our hearts, and we ask God to show us the sin that might be there, and we confess that sin. So let's take a moment and quietly pray.